تسمعني مهدي اوكي سو so, السلام عليكم ويلكم ايفريبودي تو اور ميتينغ ويكلي ميتينغ اند اي ويل ليت اور فريند دكتور رشيد داوي فروم نيويورك تو بريزنت اور جيست دكتور صدام ابيس فروم نيويورك اولسو So, uh, my friend, uh, brother Rashid, you can introduce to uh, our guests. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. And uh, I'm truly your friend and your brother, all of you. And today I have the, the great honor of introducing our speaker, Dr. Saddam Abbas, who comes to us from Ellis Hospital, Schenectady, New York, where he is the chief of cardiology. He's also the director of the cardiac amyloidosis program at St. Peter's Hospital, and he's well known in the community, he has great knowledge about the management of amyloidosis. And he is the chairman of the pulmonary embolism response team and the director of the echocardiography program at uh, uh, Ellis Hospital. Dr. Abis will be speaking and reviewing with us the management uh, of cardiac amyloidosis. Without further ado, It's my pleasure to invite Dr. Abis to start the presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Rashid, and thanks everyone for inviting me. This is a pleasure, and I hope this is not the last time I get involved to your platform uh, to continue to learn from you guys and we share knowledge together. Um, my interest in, uh, as Rashid said, I'm a cardiologist, a general cardiologist, non-invasive, and I have a lot of interest in imaging. Uh, and that's how I got the, my interest in cardiac amyloidosis. I direct the echo cardiograph, uh, cardiography program in our hospital and have interest in uh, echo imaging. Uh, and in 2018, started the program here, both in Schenectady and St. Peter's. Without uh, further ado, I'm going to start with, and you can stop me at any time. I think it's better if it's interactive, um, if you guys have questions. Um, I have no disclosures. Some of my learning objective is to review the definition and pathophysiology of amyloidosis, uh, review some of the epidemiology of amyloidosis, and then identify and describe symptoms and signs of amyloidosis. And we'll spend a little bit of time on that particular topic, the identifying and describing the symptoms and signs of amyloidosis, because I think amyloidosis have been under recognized and underdiagnosed uh, until recently. Uh, and I'll show some slides to show some of the data recently. And then we'll talk about diagnostic algorithm and we'll show a case, uh, again, all these, we'll show a few cases to highlight some of these. Uh, and then briefly review some of the available therapies for amyloidosis. As most of you know, there is not a lot of therapies for amyloidosis currently, but I think we're not able to see the future holds. So in a very uh, basic manner, amyloidosis is a disorder of protein misfolded. Folded proteins form fibrils and deposit in organs and result in organ dysfunction. This is a very simplistic approach, but an easy way to really understand amyloidosis. Um, and I think the way I tell my patients as, an, as a cardiologist, I, I divide amyloidosis to simplify it into two uh, major categories. There's the, you know, the amyloidosis from plasma cell dyscrasias. And I tell patients, this is similar to uh, having cancer. So when it's multiple myeloma, they're from the same uh, lineage of. And quite honestly, in the US, th that type of amyloidosis is predominantly managed by the hematologist oncologist. And we help with the heart failure symptoms, but they manage the treatment of the amyloidosis. And usually as you, for review, as you guys know, the bone marrow, creates plasma cells and the plasma cells have uh, proteins. And if these proteins misfold, they end up aggregating and cause and lead to amyloid fibrils, which then deposit in the end organ. Um, the other form of amyloidosis, which is called the transferritin uh, amyloidosis is a protein that's made in the liver and it's very common. And this is where a cardiologist and we've been involved more in treatment and it tend to affect more elderly patients. And really if the TTR tetramer 
misfolds, it leads to a disorganized misfolded monomers that aggregates into these fabrils. And the same thing, they deposit into the uh, end organ, particularly the myocardium and cause uh, diastolic dis or dysfunction and heart failure. Again, if we look in more detail, AL amyloidosis pathophysiology usually have an underlying clone that express that has excess production of unstable uh, free light chains and an epitope which allow aggregation, and then they aggregate into fibrils. And these fibrils can direct have direct toxicity, mainly affecting the heart. But as you can see. The 74% of the patients will develop, you know, have deposition in the heart, but only 47 develop heart failure. Kidneys, the next uh, target organ, and then liver, GI, uh, CNS, and peripheral nerve system. And we tend, these patients, we usually, when we see them, we tend to do a multidisciplinary approach to their treatment, uh, not only treated by one physician, but uh, multiple physicians in these specialty. On the other hand, the pathophysiology of transteratin amyloid, uh, the TTR uh, mRNA is made and released in the liver and then it leads to a TTR tetramer that when it folds, it, fold, it folds into these dimers, but sometimes when these proteins misfold, they become uh, amyogenic and have amorphous aggregates that deposits in organs, particularly the heart and causing a restrictive cardiomyopathy, but also they deposit in the peripheral nerves and cause a peripheral and or autonomic neuropathy. So as I said before, cardiac amyloidosis is an underdiagnosed and also is a deadly disease. And what we found since we started an amyloidosis program that, as I said before, although cardiologists were involved in the treatment of TTR amyloidosis, we have picked and diagnosed early patients of AL amyloidosis that you know has been profaned where we did to save their life. But because there's awareness, people are looking for this a little bit more carefully. And if you see, if you look, this is a slide, an old slide from uh, the Journal of Blood, looking at the prevalence of AL amyloidosis in the insurance patients between 2007 and 2015. And you can see that the number of cases are steadily rising. That's not because we have more, all of a sudden we have more AL amyloidosis, is because we're getting better at picking up the diagnosis. And there is an equal distribution between men and women, you know, males a little bit more uh, uh, than females in terms of the uh, incidence of cases per million person years, but there is a steady increase. Uh, on the other hand, TTR amyloidosis, and this slide is a little bit busy, but you can see before in the early 2000s, we didn't have diagnosis, we didn't diagnose TTR amyloidosis as much. And that's not because the number of new diagnoses was low because of the lack of accurate diagnostic tests. And then in 2008, and I'll go over this, we had more accurate, you know, with echocardiogram as well as nuclear imaging, where we can really diagnose uh, TTR amyloidosis with great accuracy without having to do myocardial biopsy. And you can see that number of cases just shot up as, you know, exponentially. This is not because we have more uh, ATTR amyloidosis, the incidence is not higher, but we're detecting it more because people are more aware of it. And these two are, the other is this is the most common hereditary form of cardiac amyloidosis. And the gray is the wild type uh, cardiac amyloidosis. More importantly, so it's underdiagnosed, but it's also deadly. If you look at the mortality at times uh, in year or the, the time to mortality or the survival curve, looking at in the green slides, this is AL amyloidosis. From the time that you diagnose the patient, till their mortality. Within the first year, they have more than 60% mortality. And within, by the time you get to two years, if these patients are untreated, there is almost greater than 80% mortality. ATTR amyloidosis have a better survival curve 
but it's still the mortality even within uh, within one year here you can see that the mortality is more than 20 percent by by three years you have a mortality of greater than 60 percent if these patients are not treated and then with, with treatment you can see that here is al no treatment and then we see with treatment we improve the survival a little bit better. This is for AL amyloidosis. Looking at that, that within uh, the first year or so, the survival is up from around, you know, 60%. Uh, I mean, the mortality is better from 60% to only 40%, but still small. Same thing with ATTR amyloidosis. So a really uh, poor prognosis for this disease if it's not recognized early. And... The reason why is the diagnosis of amyloidosis is difficult is because the symptoms are very nonspecific uh, and we'll go through some of these symptoms. So to highlight this, I'll show you guys, a review a case, uh, a patient that presented to our practice. He was a 58 year old gentleman who had history of episodic shortness of breath and pulmonary edema with moderate exertion. His past medical history was only significant for hypertension and hyperlipidemia. His initial workup showed an echocardiogram that had normal LV systolic function, diastolic dysfunction. It wasn't graded during the first echocardiogram he had. And then he underwent a cardiac catheterization. It did not demonstrate any coronary artery disease. Unfortunately, he was lost to follow up for eight months. He did not come back for follow up for up to eight months. And then he presented again eight months later to the hospital with flash pulmonary edema. Now he had mild acute kidney injury. His echocardiogram now demonstrated mild LVH and diastolic dysfunction. He had reduced global longitudinal strain. And I'll have a few slides actually to talk about strain and, and that's how I became interested in it and how do we use strain, myocardial strain to help with the diagnosis. He underwent an SPEP, UPEP with, eleva with elevated proteins and an M spike. He finally had a fat pad biopsy that confirmed AL amyloidosis with a subtype uh, amyloidosis with subtype of AL amyloidosis. This is prior to us having a program here. He was referred to treatment in Boston, which is one of the major cities here in the US, uh, you know, three hours from where we are. Uh, three months later, unfortunately, he uh, died three months later. So you can see, similar to the slides that we presented, that the time from the time to presentation to, to death was only 11 months. And that was exactly what that curve showed, that the majority of patients, well, closer to 80% without treatment of AL amyloidosis, will die within a year. And the diagnosis of AL amyloidosis, if you don't have a high, you know, high index of suspicion, can be very elusive. So symptoms for AL amyloidosis, again, are nonspecific. Every time you have unexplained diastolic dysfunction and heart failure in a young, otherwise healthy patient, I think we should suspect amyloidosis. We should have an explanation for diastolic dysfunction. Uh, you know, someone in their 50s or 40s, unless they've had long standing uncontrolled hypertension, we shouldn't stop at the diagnosis of hypertension as the cause of the diastolic dysfunction. Definitely if patients have renal dysfunction and with this combination of flash pulmonary edema and the renal dysfunction is mild, uh, again, obviously you rule out, we rule out coronary disease, but amyloidosis should be on the top of our list as well. There are some Interesting, these are, uh, you know, um, what I call pathognomonic signs of, but they tend to be a little bit more advanced AL amyloidosis. One of the physical signs you look is periorbital ecchymosis that occurs spontaneously. And then also, if you ask the patients to stink their tongue, you see the indentation of their teeth because they have macroglossia and there is actually infiltration of amyloids in the tongue as well but I thought that was an interesting physical exam finding. Uh, now, to shift gear towards the type of amyloidosis that us cardiologists deal with, and I'll spend the majority of the um, talk on this type topic, is 
An 85-year-old female had presented to our hospital with orthostatic hypotension and syncope. Her past medical history was significant for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. She was only able to tolerate low dose diuretics, so she had a narrow therapeutic window. She had stage four chronic kidney disease. Um, she's had history of carpal tunnel surgery. She also had a history of unexplained weight loss, hypertension, thrombocytosis, and leukocytosis. Her EKG showed sinus rhythm and a low voltage. So the reason why I presented this case because it explains a lot of the um, symptoms that we are associated with amyloidosis. So one of the major companies here, drug companies, Visor, have come up with a mnemonic to help us remember uh, the symptoms and the signs and the symptoms of ATTR amyloidosis. And it's called ATTR can be hidden. So H is for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. If someone has intolerance of standard heart failure medications, you should, uh, that should also raise your suspicion of amyloidosis. Discordance between the QRS voltage and the amount of LVH on echocardiogram. You know, very common. This is the, the old teaching that LV, you know, amyloidosis has low LVH on the uh, low voltage on the uh, EKG, but has LVH on echocardiogram. It's not, it's, it's not very sen sensitive, but if it, if it does happen, it should raise your suspicion. Interestingly, the diagnosis of carpal tunnel or spinal stenosis is actually very common and it precedes, it's in about 10% of these cases, it precedes the diagnosis of amyloidosis or the symptoms of amyloidosis by 10 years. So every time if you go and ask these patients, particularly hereditary amyloidosis, they've had a history of carpal tunnel or spinal stenosis. And again, nerve, the other one is for, the E is for echocardiogram demonstrating LVH and then nervous system dysfunction, including autonomic dysfunction, GI symptoms. Uh, as, we sh as I showed previously that amyloidosis doesn't only affect the um, myocardium and the kidneys and the renal function, it also, uh, and the renal parenchyma, it also affects uh, GI tract as well as the autonomic system. So this lady, go ahead, did someone had a question? No, 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 it's okay. Okay, I'm gonna go keep, keep going. So this lady, uh, if we go back and look at her history, she had all the signs really related to ATTR amyloidosis. She presented with autonomic dysfunction with evidence of orthostatic hypotension and syncope. She had history of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. She was intolerant of medications, of heart failure medications. She had kidney disease. She also had carpal tunnel surgery prior. She had history of unexplained weight loss and had a low voltage. Um, sorry, this is okay. So if you look at the timing of diagnostic testing, like I was saying to the time of uh, um, the disease manifestation, if you look, the most common early on is orthopedic manifestation, bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, biopsy tendon, uh, bi bicep tendon rupture, and lumbar stenosis. We always ask our patients, oh, if you have patients that have this, you want to keep, especially as cardiologists, we're not, we don't look into this, but you monitor them as you monitor them longitudinally. You, you try to look, see if these patients in a decade later, they'll develop, if they develop diastolic dysfunction uh, or restrictive cardiomyopathy, uh, amyloidosis should be on the top of your list. Obviously, if you go into biopsy, you'll see early on the amyloid deposits in the myocardium. But we like to avoid biopsy because, as you know, it's an invasive uh, treatment. And also, if, depending on when you do the biopsy of amyloid of, of the myocardium, sometimes the amyloid, if it's an early on, you can miss amyloidosis, and it shouldn't be a definitive. It should be a last resort nowadays. Uh, we PET scan uh, is also uh, common, but more importantly, recently in the United States, we had a nucleus scintigraphy which with uh, 
PYP scan, and I think in Europe they do DPD, uh, DPD uh, and HMDP uh, tracers, but really the P, uh, PYP tracer here in the myocardium has a high affinity for amyloidosis and really ruled out amyloidosis or ruled in amyloidosis with a specificity of greater than 98%. And then once you've had the myocardium is already, there are amyloid deposits in the myocardium, you start having evidence of myocardial dysfunction and by elevated troponins as well as uh, nitratic peptides, diastolic dysfunction. And symptoms are very late. Electrical changes also happens very late in deposit, right? Because you have to have significant amount of deposit. And then really once patients have a per burned out cardiomyopathy, they go into a systolic dysfunction. I wanted to, you know, this is, uh, because someone, I just wanted to highlight this, it was recently in Jack, uh, in the Journal uh, of the American College of Cardiology, they did a good series looking at the cumulative incidence of amyloidosis in patients who have uh, carpal tunnel versus control patients. If you look, the control patients are in red. Over the years, years since the index event, I would, since they, you know, they uh, started monitoring them, Patients that had no carpal tunnel control substance did not develop amyloidosis, but at patients that have carpal tunnel, within about 10% or 0.1% of, uh, of these patients have developed uh, 0.1 out of 100, about 10% have developed amyloidosis. And also, if you look at the incidence of heart failure, just plain heart failure in patients that have carpal tunnel syndrome, if you monitor them for a decade, you start seeing the curve diverge. Patients that don't have carpal tunnel syndrome don't develop, really, they develop heart failure at a lower rate, and these patients are at double the time of, the, um, uh, of their um, counterparts. There, fortunately, there is no, I mean, the study was not powered enough to look at mortality, but in this study, they didn't, there was no, the incidence of death was the same. Uh, between the two groups. So if we go back just to summarize, you know, looking at, move this out of, looking at TTR amyloidosis, it affects the amyloid fibrils come and affect the GI tract and the autonomic nerves, the sensory motor nerves and the myocardium. And when they do this, the manifestations, these are what we should be looking at for these patients when we're uh, seeing them in our clinic is, do they have muscle weakness? Do they have impaired uh, ambulation, especially as they get older and trying to differentiate that from orthopedic issues? Uh, do they have a history of falls and orthostatic hypotension, constipation and diarrhea is also because of the GI tract involvement, and then heart failure and arrhythmias uh, and syncope from arrhythmias as well. Any questions so far before I go into the next, which is the biggest uh, field, the diagnostic algorithms? Have you any question in the audience? All right, so I, I'll continue and then we'll uh, hopefully we'll, if anyone has questions towards the end. We'll, this is a busy slide, but this is also adapted from one of the journals and Jack about the diagnostic algorithm, and I'll go through each one of them. Uh, but the, this is similar to what we have in our clinic. You know, when patients come in with symptoms that are suspicious, we start with the routine EKG, ECG, as well as echo. Sometimes we obtain MRI and or biomarkers. If there are any suggestion in these screening tests of cardiac amyloidosis, we, the first thing is to do before we can move to the next step is to screen for the presence of a monoclonal protein. Because as I said before, this is really, you know, missing AL amyloidosis is, could be catastrophic. And in my mind, that's the most important part of an amyloidosis program to try to capture those patients and get them in treatment very quickly. Uh, and again, I, we usually here, we partner with our hematology partners, but we start with 
at least the screening uh, SPEP and UPEP and make sure you get uh, immunofixation because immunofixation is where you're gonna uh, detect the monoclonal proteins. And then if these patients are abnormal, we refer them to hematology and hematology will do other testing, including uh, mass spect for immunostatin, uh, you know, biopsy, uh, either organ involvement biopsy or fat pad biopsy. Now, if you have someone that's suspicious, remember fat pad biopsy is not very sensitive and specific. So I would go to uh, target organ if you are still concerned about uh, amyloidosis. And then for if their proteins are, monoclonal proteins are normal, we move into the bone centigraphy with the nuclear testing to try to detect ATTR amyloidosis. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. I just, I wanted to show a case afterwards and to show what we do in ECHO. Um, but if someone has, uh, if your bone centigraphy is positive, then you want to really, uh, we tend to do genetic testing because genetic testing is important for the, not only for the patient, the treatment doesn't change, but for the patient's family members. Uh, if their bone centrigraphy is negative or indeterminate, then we think that cardiac amyloidosis is unlikely. If the suspicion remains high clinically, remember, none of these tests are 100%. If you're still clinically suspicious that this patient has amyloidosis, then we would recommend a myocardial biopsy, but it happens very rarely. And on the other hand, if patients, uh, uh, if they had on the bone centrigraphy is not available, you can go ahead and do either an MRI, like I said, or a bone uh, or either a biopsy, either a fat pad biopsy or myocardial biopsy. So as I said before, my interest had been in imaging and I wanted to spend, since you know this is a, a bunch of cardiologists, I wanted to just get back and say, how do I become interested in uh, amyloidosis? And one of the reasons why now we have a, uh, a strong interest in amyloidosis is because I think our imaging capability has improved significantly in the last uh, decade. Uh, as you know that the improved transducer technology like GE has this patent technology called C-Sound technology and Philips machines, they have n -Site. Those are the two most common uh, echo machines used in the US. Uh, I know some places use uh, um, Siemens and so I don't have a, a lot of knowledge about them, but both of these systems and I'm assuming so they have uh, the, the new technology allows us to process images at very, very high speed and allow us to really compress significant amount of data and that is equivalent to playing it almost an entire DVD in just one second in real time. What that translates into us from imaging, there is a very accurate and speckled image that you can really look at the myocardium uh, almost at a granular level. Um, and that allowed us to really revise our thought of LV function. You know, ejection fraction is no longer really uh, a best measurement of LV function. It's, an, it's a measurement of myocardium and blood displacement, right? It doesn't really tell you about the myocardium. Is the myocardium healthy? Because you can have a preserved LV function or preserved ejection fraction, but really reduced LV function in the sense that the LV stiff or the myocardium is not contracting well. And I, I'll just, this is a video that I borrowed from the Mayo Clinic from one of the lectures I went to and really highlights how we should think about uh, myocardial function. As you can see, this is a, a depiction of how the heart contracts. The heart really has the majority of the myocardial function is this twisting function. It's not really a displacement vessel. And this twisting function, when you look at it, it twists up and down and it goes circumferentially, side to side. When we look at uh, the ejection fraction, ejection fraction takes into account only the circumferential uh, contraction but the biggest portion in heart function is this longitudinal contraction. Um, uh, and, and with this, with us being able to look at that, 
more accurately now with echocardiogram. It helps us now accurately diagnose LV function uh, and look at it in a more granular approach. So I know most of you know this, but just for review, uh, when we look at myocardial strain, strain, the definition of strain is basically the deformation produced by application of stress. And if you look at the change in myocardial muscle length, and to me, this is amazing that now we can actually with really good accuracy, look at the myocardial length and the displacement of the myocardium by using this ultrasound technology. So we're looking at the individual uh, speckles or individual areas of the myocardium and track them and see how they contract uh, and um, uh, during uh, how they contract during systole and then relax during diastole. And when we look at strain, a strain is looking basically at the instantaneous length at any particular point as opposed and then divide the difference between that from the original, how much that particular speckle had moved from its original space divided by the length and that gives you the change in the length of the myocardium. And the way this is done by echo, because remember when I said that there is improved image process and identifies and track these table called myocardial footprints. So in the myocardium, you can see this is at a, we took in a piece from here and you can look at all these little speckles. There is an algorithm in the computer that tracks particular speckles and they put them into regions and then really look by the interaction between the myocardium and the ultrasound beam we can see how much this particular speckle moved from its original place. And then the analysis of that spatial dislocation or the tracking of that speckle represent the movement of tissue to frame. And that's what myocardial deformation is. The greater degrees of deformation, they are expressed as a numerically negative, more negative strain value means more normal because where you're going from the original value, how, more, how, away, how much away you're going from it. And again, this was just some of the original studies that they looked at the fibers and also, uh, you know, I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Gorson when I was in residency, he was at University of Pittsburgh and he did some of the studies and looked at the myocardial shortening and some of the pathophysiology and also did a lot of strain. Um, the way strain curves are presented in uh, uh, when we get these curves on the, uh, uh, in the echo machine or in the echo uh, images, we're looking at basically at the whole curve, it looks like at the timing between systole and diastole, you look at isovolemic contraction time all the way to diastole. And then this is in strain, you have this negative curve that comes, means with during systole that the myocardium is contracting, so it becomes negative. And then during isovolemic relaxation time, there is a little bit of in, the myocardium tends back up and starts relaxing and then the diastole relax and goes back to normal. And this is what we're all used to in tissue Doppler uh, or TDI, looking at the myocardial velocities, what we use for diastolic dysfunction. Uh, again, you can also look at the normal longitudinal curve by tissue Doppler. Uh, this is just another depiction because it can tell you how deep it is. It tells you how much LV function and displacement it is. And what the machines end up reporting to you in a healthy individual, you see this nice curve with all the segments contracting together normally. Each one of these color represents a segment in this view. So if you can see this is yellow, this is green, this is blue, this is green. So in each one of these curves, it, it's tracked and it tracks it during systole until the, you know, the highest, or this is the maximal myocardial shortening because the myocardium is contracting and shortening as much as possible. And then it goes all the way up back during uh, diastole and it tracks all these se segments. And then it's also presented the way we are pre we present this in our reports is looking at the three orthogonal views and then presented as the peak systolic strain 
And this is important because we use this uh, in the literature. You're gonna see when we talk about amyloidosis, something called sherry on top, which is basically that there is dysfunction in the myocardium in the basal segment, but the apical segments are preserved. And I'm assuming you guys use this same, same uh, depiction, especially when you re read uh, nuclear stress tests. Uh, you know, these are, you know, the uh, 17 segments of the myocardium, you know, the anterior septal, septal, inferior, lateral, and anterior wall, uh, and then going from base to apex. So I wanted to show you guys a case. Uh, before I move on, I know that that topic is a little bit loaded and it can be a topic by its own myocardial strain. Anyone have questions about that? Okay, so the next, now I wanted to present a case of a guy to, and we'll go through his images. This was a 59 year old gentleman with past medical history of hypertension had an abnormal EKG with an anteroseptal infarct pattern, had uh, non-cardiac chest pain seven to eight months prior to presentation. His workup had included normal nuke and cardiac catheterization. Then he presented 15, uh, with 15 pounds weight gain and dyspnea, and this was his echocardiogram. So as you can, I'm gonna go back here, as you can see, here from his echocardiogram, very thick inter, uh, interventricular septum, thick walls here, has really speckled uh, image uh, myocardium. And even here, you don't see it, we're gonna see it better in the other. The RV free wall is also um, very thick. And uh, his valves uh, do appear to be a little bit thickened and has a little bit of a, uh, pericardial effusion and a pleural, a large pleural effusion, as you can see here. Um, again, this is the short access view. You see that pericardial effusion a little bit better. I'm uh, sorry, the pleural effusion. And you can see how thick the muscle is, the myocardium, but also part of the RV is thick as well. Here is a four chamber view with the LV, RV, and then left atrium and uh, right atrium, you can see atrial enlargement here, but really diffuse hypertrophy throughout both uh, ventricles, as well as his uh, valves are thickened. And this is really classic uh, amyloidosis, but I would say this by this time, this is almost end stage. I won't spend a lot of time just for the interest of time, this is, you know, looking at diastolic dysfunction, as most of you know, we look at the parameters for diastolic dysfunction, uh, looking at uh, Doppler inflow and tissue Doppler, and then looking at the TR jet. Clearly his uh, tissue Doppler velocities are very low. And if we did the calculations, they didn't do it in this case, but it has at least grade two or if, if not grade three diastolic dysfunction. Then this is this is the type of report we get, you know, on our uh, when we do the myocardial strain. Uh, I didn't show the uh, curves, but you can see that the more negative, the more normal. So in in this particular, and each company uh, manufacturer have an, a cutoff for normal that's different. In the Philips machine, the cutoff for normal is negative 16 and above. So negative 16, negative 19, negative 18, those are normal. You can see the apical segments. This is the true apex, apical anterior, apical lateral, apical inferior, apical lateral, apical inferior. You can see these are, the strain is preserved and re remains relatively normal. But the segments, the basal segments and the mid segments are abnormal with less negative strain. And the blue ones actually tells you that there is, uh, when we look at the blue ones, that there is dyskinetic segments or segments that uh, have a um, abnormal contraction uh, of the myocardium. Also, when we looked at that, if you look at, it gives us the calculation of his ejection fraction, although his ejection fraction is relatively preserved, it was mildly reduced at 14.7, uh, at 47%. 
0.47%. Uh, his myocardial strain, his global strain is negative 12.7%. And uh, normal is above 16 uh, or negative 16%. And this pattern, if you look this up, uh, this sherry on top pattern is suggestive of amyloidosis. It's seen in amyloidosis, but it's not only in amyloidosis. There's other pathways. But if you see this in the combination of diastolic dysfunction and LVH, is highly suggestive of amyloidosis. And then the last uh, diagnostic imaging study is cardiac MRI. As most of you know, here is a cardiac MRI showing, uh, this is a still image of the cardiac MRI showing that he has significant LVH in both the uh, uh, interatrial septum as well as the uh, LV free wall, lateral wall, and the atria are dilated. And then this is late gadolinium enhancement. You can see significant amount of fibrosis throughout uh, the myocardium. And the fibrosis is not only in the LV, but you can also see it in the uh, LA uh, walls as well. So this person has pretty advanced amyloidosis. And I won't spend a lot of time, and I don't know if you guys do this uh, in, uh, in Algeria uh, in terms of the uh, PYP scan uh, for uh, uh, bone centrigraphy. Uh, it's done in our nuclear lab. Some places the radiology do it, but here the, cardio we, the cardiologists do it with part of the nuclear lab. And you can see it actually has a very high, these are two patients in the study looking at AL amyloidosis uh, and uh, ATTR amyloidosis. And you can see that with ATTR amyloidosis, there's a high affinity for the PYP tracer, uh, you know, the pyrophosphate tracer, uh, and you can see the myocardium here. We, obviously, these are taken up in the bone, but it's more in the uh, in the myocardium, where this patient with AL amyloidosis, there's no uptake of that tracer. So this has been suggestive to be, you know, almost a diagnostic and very sensitive and specific for ATTR amyloidosis. The last diagnostic testing we do is, or testing, as I mentioned before, is genetic testing. And the only, in the interest of time, the only thing that I'm gonna say is that there are particular type of uh, genetic de uh, deficiencies that have a more cardiac phenotype. The most common we see in the United States is this V122I seen predominantly in African-Americans and they tend to have, these patients have to have, tend to have more cardiac manifestations. The V30M uh, uh, defect tend to have more neurologic uh, manifestations uh, with the neuropathy, et cetera. What about cardiac biomarkers? You know, people have asked about, you know, can we use cardiac biomarkers to help in the diagnosis? I think the role, and this was a nice review that was done in uh, Jack, the Journal of American College of Cardiology uh, in 2020 in their heart failure uh, section, looking at biomarkers are good for staging and for prognosis. We use the biomarkers in light chain amyloidosis, we look at BMP and cardiac troponins as well as free light chain difference. Uh, and then in the wild type, as well as the hereditary type, we'll look at troponins and EGFR. Um, and we use these to monitor patients and look at uh, their um, response to treatment. And there is some studies trying to look at serum transteratin level, which as most of you know, that transteratin level, we, it's pre-albumin. However, pre-albumin is affected by many other diseases, so it's not as, as sensitive or specific, but uh, we were looking at that to look at the response of therapy. Again, for the interest of time, we look at staging of this. We, we, when we discuss our cancel patients, depending on where their troponin level, how high is their troponin and their BMP, from a heart failure standpoint, this, this cutoff tells us what stage they are whether they stage one, stage two. And it's important 
because for the prognosis, particularly in light chain amyloidosis, if you have someone that comes in with florid heart failure where their BMP as well as their troponin are elevated uh, and significantly elevated, their survival, their prognosis is only four months without treatment. Um, you know, some other studies looked at there. If you look at incorporate, li you know, free light chain, you have a little bit more of um, in improves the sensitivity. But again, the survival, it's very important to monitor biomarkers to help tell the patients their prognosis. Uh, and this was just for ATTR similar. As you can see, that ATTR amyloidosis has a better uh, prognosis. Patients tend to survive longer than once with AL amyloidosis. Um, again, I'll skip this. I'll go into the therapeutic interventions. So some of the therapeutic interventions that we tend to do as cardiologists use lower dose of diuretics. Remember, these patients are preload dependent. They have a very narrow therapeutic window. If you over diurese them, they end up going into kidney failure and also uh, having issues with hypotension and syncope. Most of the time, these patients, because of the conduction system issues, they are unable to tolerate beta blockers or ACE inhibitors. So I tend to take, in order to improve their energy and allow them to allow us to diurese them, I tend to take them off beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. Digoxin should be avoided in these patients. Uh, particularly if they have arrhythmia because digoxin binds to the amyloid fibrils and can lead to increased level of misfolded proteins. Um, you know, a new area that we don't have a lot of data on is device therapy. There's The data is lacking here. We don't know. There are some studies that suggest that patients are dying due to electrical or mechanical dissociations and bradyhythmias. Uh, there's an interest to look at, you know, what is the role of permanent pacemakers in ICD? Um, but that's still uh, ongoing. For if you look at amyloidosis, if we, if we go back into the two different types of amyloidosis, for AL amyloidosis, they were both discovered around the same time AL amyloidosis and TTR amyloidosis in almost in the mid 1800s. And since then, we have had really not a lot of treatment. And then in, 19, in the 1990s, for AL amyloidosis, there was stem cell transplant. And then some chemotherapy came with cyborg BD in 2005. And then in 2019, now we have immunotherapy and patients really doing extremely well. For TTR amyloidosis, we really haven't had any therapy. The only thing that we had had previously when we, because this used to be called senile amyloidosis. It tends to affect patients that are older. And we used to have only a liver transplant. And most of these patients didn't qualify for a liver transplant. And then in 2018, 2019, we started having trials on stabilizers and silencers. And I'll go over one of the seminal trials that was published in 2018 with Tefamidus, uh, one of the medications that we, it's a, a stabilizer that we use in the United States frequently. Uh -huh. So as I said before, if you look at the pathway, there are a couple of medications. So there are enterosin and uh, patiserin. Uh, these prevent hepatic uh, production. So they are silencers. These are not approved. They're not FDA approved for cardiac uh, disease. They've been used in uh, patients with peripheral neuropathy. There's ongoing studies with both of these to look at them for cardiomyopathy. Tefamidus, on the other hand, is a stabilizer of the TTR tetrana. It tends to stabilize the tetrana so that it doesn't misfold, but it doesn't prevent the, uh, the production of it. Um, and this was the seminal trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine for tefamidus for the treatment of transteratin arthroid, and it's called the ATTRACT study. Again, similar patient population as we talked, the patients here are predominantly older patients. The average age is around 75 years old. 
predominantly males, less than females. Uh, you know, a mixed, the majority of these patients were uh, Caucasians. The majority of them had wild type. Uh, about a third or a quarter of them had uh, the hereditary type of amyloidosis. Um, uh, you know, their blood pressure, their heart failure classification, most patients were class two that were included in the trial, my uh, class three, and then you can see their PMB. And what they looked at analysis of all cause mortality, looking at tefamidus, pooled tefamidus versus placebo. You can see even after starting the medication, you really don't start seeing divergence in the mortality or the survival curve until 18 months or so. So early diagnosis of these patients and treating them early helps us to see, you know, to try to benefit, to benefit this patient. But more importantly, uh, when you look at subgroup analysis, the survival, if the patients are still early, class one or class two heart failure, that benefits the families more than placebo. If you get to these patients when they're a little bit too late, they're already in class three uh, uh, heart failure, the benefit from the medication is attenuated. One of the other things we look at is the baseline six minute walk test, because we tell patients this medication is not a cure. It, what it does, it decreases the progression of disease. And one of those is this six minute walk test of the uh, Kansas City uh, quality of life questionnaire. And you can see that pool to families patient, they have an improvement in their symptoms at, even at starting as they start diverge between them and the placebo at six months, 12 months, 18 months, those patients, the decline in their activity is lower as compared to those where that have placebo. Same thing in the quality of life in MERS, those images. So where do we stand? You know, future therapies. This is Vindivax was approved in the, in, which is to families is the trade name for it. In the United States, there are these ongoing trial phase three with this, with the silencers. You know, before all we had was liver transplantation but now we have all these options uh, for ATTR amyloidosis. We have one option and the rest of these uh, ongoing trials hopefully will bring more options to these patients. Uh, for the AL amyloidosis, again, I'm not a hematologist or oncologist, but there is a lot of research looking at multiple, you know, uh, uh, monoclonal therapy as well as immunotherapy to help uh, with AL amyloidosis. And we've seen some of the patients on the immunotherapy uh, really do well uh, and their survival has improved. Uh, so take home points that I have for you guys and with hopefully a few minutes left. Uh, amyloidosis you know, can be hidden in plain sight. Really take a look at and have a really high suspicion, index of suspicion. AL amyloidosis has poor prognosis, therefore creating a referral network and having a place where you can see these patients because most of the time cardiologists are the ones that are diagnosing this because patients have uh, uh, restrictive myopathy or diastolic dysfunction and you don't want to miss. I showed you a couple of our patients early on where we missed the boat where a patient was diagnosed and we were thinking coronary disease, other things before we went to AL amyloidosis and then the patient died within 11 months. Uh, so ALM, and we've had a couple other cases, but now having a network of people, particularly uh, hematologists that are interested in this disease, you can, once you see these patients, refer them and start treatment quickly. ATTR amyloidosis is more prevalent, has a better prognosis than AL amyloidosis, but we can, with some of the treatment modalities now with the stabilizers and hopefully silencers, we can improve these patients' symptoms. And improve diagnostic tools, and then hopefully um, emergent treatment options. And I think more importantly that I would say is creating local expertise, having one or two people that are local expertise would tend to help uh, with the treatment and also the awareness. And I will open it to any questions. Thank you. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Are you listening? Are you hearing me?
Yes, I hear you. Thank you. I appreciate it. We have uh, Dr. Dahiman. You have a question, Dr. Dahiman Nawal. You have asked a question in the in the chat, so you can. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I have two uh, two questions for uh, Dr. Abiz. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. So my two questions are: uh, Is the two type of uh, amyloidosis that can be associated? And if yes, is specific therapies for each type can uh, be used in the same patient? So the patients can, you know, we've had. Uh, uh, I haven't seen patients that have concomitant, you know, AL amyloidosis and ATTR amyloidosis. Uh, we've I've read in the literature that sometimes if patients have a both concomitant AL and TTR amyloidosis, uh, the best to, for his diagnostic is to do an actual diagnostic uh, biopsy to differentiate. So I would, you know, if you're concerned that they have. Uh, significant if they have if you obtain their uh, urine and serum proteins and their proteins are elevated i would treat for al amyloidosis because that tends to be more deadly so with immunotherapy and uh, and uh, also some chemotherapy in conjunction with hematologists your other question is there specific parameters to judge if there is a therapeutic response or not is that the other question someone put that in the chat so I will answer the specific parameters we look to judge if there is therapeutic response or not is basically biomarkers and symptoms. They haven't, there's ongoing studies looking at myocardial strain from echo to see if the strain improve as well as PYP tracer uptake on bone centrigraphy. We can quantify how much the, uh, at this point we can, there is a two modes to read the pulse centrigraphy. You can do a qualitative as well as a quantitative by looking at the myocardial uptake of the PYP compared to the lung uptake. And there is some research that's ongoing to look at, is that a useful parameter for us to monitor for response to therapy in TTR amyloidosis? On top of the biomarkers, as well as symptoms in AL amyloidosis, we look at light chain fraction and light chain ratio. So we work with the hematologist uh, to continue to monitor, and that's how we detect if patients therapy uh, are responding to therapy. There is a question from Azuz. Azuz, Abdul Malik, you can ask your question. Abdul Malik, Azuz. Oh, yes, he said uh, how to manage beta blockers and uh, RB. AAR, RB. ARB. So usually, um, like I said, with beta blockers, patients tend to be very intolerant of a lot of the cardiac medications. So what I balance is if, because they become hypotensive uh, very frequently, and what I tend to favor and they're symptomatic from their dyspnea, we tend to either decrease their beta blocker and actually atenolol tends to be one of the most tolerated beta blocker. Either put them on a low dose of atenolol while we're trying to go up on their diuretic. And we tend to use torsamide as opposed to furosemide because it has a little bit better bioavailability and you can use smaller doses. Um, and it's these patients need to be seen frequently. So I to take them off if they're having issues with hypotension, fatigue. The first thing is to take them off of their beta blocker or wean them off their beta blocker to allow you to be able to diurese them more. And, and what about new treatment of uh, cardiac heart failure, like uh, dapagliflozin or? So agreed. Uh, that's, that's an interesting, because remember, these patients have a restrictive cardiomyopathy, and there's a new indication for diastolic heart failure yeah, yeah. for, uh, you know, uh, some of the, the SGLT2 inhibitors. We haven't really used them a lot in, the, um, in patients with amyloidosis, because that was just a new indication. I'm looking forward to see how it's going to work, because we've had great results 
in other, you know, in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, as well as in other types of uh, your doses uh, and other types of diastolic uh, heart failure. The issue becomes usually patients, you know, we've tried in Tresto in some of these patients, they don't tolerate it because of the hypotension. And remember, because they have autonomic dysfunction, they tend not to tolerate a lot of the medications. And they feel, believe it or not, they feel better once you take them off of their cardiac medications. You have another question, if you can uh, see yes. on, on the chat. Yes, it's concerning screening. We have we see a lot of young patients with diastolic dysfunction. Should we search for amyloidosis in this category? So I, I this is yes, I agree. Diastolic dysfunction in younger patients, and I in the U.S. we say younger patients, anyone less than seventy is considered young. So you know anyone in that young or between forty to sixty years old, if you don't have an explanation for their diastolic dysfunction. If, you, if you're saying their diastolic dysfunction is related to hypertension, they, we have to document that they've had long stand in hypertension. As more, many of you know, you have to have long term high, uh, hypertension in order to develop diastolic dysfunction. If they don't have that, if they have other, uh, uh, other signs of, um, for example, low voltage, LVH that is out of proportion to the amount of uh, of uh, 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 to the amount of uh, uh, to the ACG to the QRS amplitude on the EKG, those will be one of the fir first things that uh, I will screen them for AL amyloidosis. And as you can see, AL uh, my biggest concern is if we miss AL amyloidosis. TTR amyloidosis, the average age, actually, if someone is less than 70 years old and they come in and we test them and they have TTR amyloidosis, we think this is gonna be an aggressive form of TTR amyloidosis. Because TTR amyloidosis, you only see it and you start seeing it in older patients. So if you have a younger person, less than 70 or less than 60 years old that has you know, profound diastolic dysfunction, I will rule them out with um, checking their proteins to make sure they don't have ALM to screen them. Thank you. Rabbi, Rabbi, I'd like, I'd like just to add one thing. When uh, we talked previously about the use of SGL2 inhibitor, we have to be careful in using the SGL2 inhibitor in uh, amyloidosis patients, especially they are preload dependent and with the diuretic effect of the SGL2 inhibitor, it may cause more hypotension, and especially if they are taking low dose of diuretic. So just want to add this comment to the previous question. I agree, thank you so much. I think that's, and that's what we found where we had issues with Intresto as well, uh, with the uh, uh, um, Valsart and Sucupitrel uh, when we did, but I agree, these patients have a very narrow therapeutic window and they tend to get dehydrated. And then if they have renal dysfunction, Obviously, we shouldn't be using SGL2 inhibitors. Thank you. So, is there uh, any question? One last question. If there is no question, uh, uh, Mike, please. Mike, go ahead. Second. Oh, la, 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 la. First. Microwave. Uh, our friend da, da Rashid Dawi, if you want to, to conclude this very interesting session, and uh, thank you uh, very much for our guest, to our guest, Saddam Abi. Shukran, Kazila. Thank you very much. so much for having me. Thank you very much, Dr. Abis. We are, we are really delighted to have you with us, and we learn so much personally i'm a nephrologist but i learned and i was really impressed by the c sound and the n side technology very interesting and uh, very interesting the way you emphasize that we have to make diagnosis early and may, and pay attention to the carpal tunnel symptom and the, because you can change the, the outcome especially of al amyloidosis and um, 
but it was very impressive and and we are looking forward to have you with us and we are including you in the you know in the in last part of the you know the member and we are looking for you for you to forward to uh, maybe uh, give us more lecture in the future inshallah and we i will i'm thanking you uh, on behalf of all my colleagues the algerian they are present here and we are we thank you and uh, god bless you and thank you very much thank you so much thank you for having me look forward to future thank you for everybody thank you Doctor, do, do you want to discuss the case or uh, that uh, case that you are going to say or no okay, okay. شكرا 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 للجميع